Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Doug Lantry. I'm a historian and curator in the museum's research division. And what we're doing for these couple of days, more than two weeks, is celebrating the Air Force in space. And especially we're using the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 15 mission as the, the event that we hang this space celebration on. Apollo 15 is really special to the Air Force among Apollo missions because it was the only all Air Force flight crew. So all three of the astronauts who went to the moon and back were Air Force officers. So that's a, that's a big uh, stand up straight point of pride for us. And that's the principal reason why we have the Apollo 15 spacecraft, which is on display behind the smart board here. So my talk today is gonna be a brief and breezy walk through the Apollo 15 mission. We'll, we'll hit the high points, and uh, there's, of course, more detail uh, on our website and in signage and so on, but I picked out some interesting pictures to describe some of the highlights, and we can go through and sort of discuss what was happening. So, to begin with, the big picture of Apollo 15. Apollo 15 included a lot of firsts and refinements in Apollo technology and mission design. It was the first of the so-called J missions. The J missions were designed to lift a larger payload from the Earth to the Moon, to conduct more experiments, to stay longer, and to increase mobility and stay time on the Moon for the astronauts. And this served a couple of purposes, not only did it advance the technology of living and working in space and especially working on the moon, but it allowed more mass and more time for scientific experimentation. And so the twin objectives of Apollo are advanced in the first of the J missions by putting more stuff up there for a longer time and allowing the crew to do more work. And so this is a feature of all these Apollo missions over time is they get longer and longer and the crew is able to do more and more with more and better equipment over time. And we'll see as we go along, their equipment really did change um, in the J missions. This one was the first to feature a four wheel drive vehicle on the moon. And imagine the excitement of the crew they might not have said so, but you know they were thinking, I get to drive a four-wheel drive vehicle on the moon. And as you may or may not know, these crew members had hot sports cars on Earth that they drove around in. So they were no strangers to having fun driving. The lunar roving vehicle, of course, was a completely different experience in four-wheel driving. But when you consider what that vehicle could do and where it did it, uh, it, I think, justifies the cost, which was, get ready for it, $38 million for that vehicle. That was the, the final cost. The out-of-the-box cost was a lot less than that, but, you know, costs grow, right? So it went from $19 million, I think, to about $38 million in the end. So was shipping free? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, <laughs> well, there was a destination charge, I think. But um, uh, they, they got the keys and they did the test drives. You know, they, they were familiar with the vehicle before they bought it. So they didn't just, you know, drive it off the lot. So <laughs> That's good. Free shipping. Can I use that this afternoon? Um, I, um, maybe I'll need a picture of you to put on there and say, this, this is our guest who, who gave me this line. Um, well, what about the people? What about the crew? These Air Force members that we're so proud of. Here's their crew portrait, one of many, but I, I think this is, this is probably the best one because I like the moon background on it. The commander of the mission, Colonel David Scott, uh, he was, and, and forgive me for referring to my notes, but uh, an awful lot to digest early this morning and remember so that I make sure that I get it right. Um, he was a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy. Remember, all these guys became astronauts and, and graduated from military academies in the days before the Air Force Academy came along. So 
uh, he, was a, he was a U.S. Military Academy guy, also from MIT, and he became the seventh man to walk on the moon. He commanded the mission. Uh, the guy in the middle, Alfred Warden, was an Air Force major. He was a University of Michigan guy and also U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and he was the guy who kept everything in order in orbit. Um, that role, if you think back to Apollo 11, and we celebrate uh, uh, General Michael Collins a lot, the role of keeping everything in order in orbit while the other two are on the moon is far more than just making sure, just, you know, keeping house. There's a lot of work to do up there to make sure everything goes right and to make sure that the ride home is on time, in the right place, and available, and all the photography experiments get done. So he was a busy boy in orbit, not just sitting there waiting for the other two. Um, the guy on the far right, Lieutenant Colonel James Irwin, the U.S. Naval Academy guy, and also University of Michigan. So being in Ohio today uh, and commenting on that, that, that there's these Michigan guys flying the, flying the spacecraft, you know, we always have to import this Ohio versus Michigan thing. But uh, it's no fun if you don't have competition, right? So um, hooray for the University of Michigan and all the military academies because they've all given us uh, some terrific Air Force officers and crew members, especially these guys. This crew was selected at the end of March 1970. And so all of the training for the particular mission we're talking about uh, took place over about a year between March 70 and the spring, early summer of 71. So they spent a lot of time learning about geology and driving the vehicle and learning every last moment of the mission schedule and the mission objectives. As you may well imagine, Apollo astronauts, and really all astronauts, are super, super, super mission focused. And they've got the entire routine schedule and objectives in their head. And they're very, very focused on doing everything on time exactly right. And in the Apollo program, as in others, the, what they were striving for was to fly the perfect mission to make sure everything went right and on time. That was, that was the standard, to do it all perfectly. And so they got to practice for about a year. There's some really good photos you can find online of these guys out in the desert, driving things around and hammering on rocks and carrying backpacks and taking pictures of things, hanging around with geologists and other scientists and learning about what's a rock, what do you, when you see a rock on the ground, what do you look for? What do you say about it? What can you learn about it? So they became amateur geologists and they demonstrated the value, along with other Apollo astronauts, of actually having people on the scene, of having people there and making observations and comparing one thing to another and deciding what to do and where to go next and what to pay attention to within the larger mission design. That is something that the machines we had at the time couldn't do. They didn't have the human judgment, and they certainly didn't have the Mark I eyeball and the brain behind it. And so the value of crew members on the moon was demonstrated by these amateur geologists who were very well trained in what to look at and what they could figure out about it. The vehicles. People are very interested in what, what was the machine like? How was the machine configured? Well, the Apollo Saturn launch vehicle, you can see a nice model of one over here made by uh, some of our very talented volunteers and their ability to 3D print things. That vehicle was 363 feet tall. That is a big, big rocket. For comparison, the Titan IV-B behind us here, stretching from there to there, is 204 feet long. Add about another 150 feet to that, and you've got Saturn V. 
So it was an incredibly large vehicle. And all up, the thing weighed more than six million pounds. That's about the weight of 250 average school buses. What I'd like to see is 250 model school buses stacked up beside that, just so, just so that I could see, just so that I could make that mental comparison. Think of a machine capable of lifting 250 school buses off of the earth. It takes a lot of energy to lift something off of the earth and into space. It takes an incredible amount of energy. The vehicle itself was divided into three main stages. The first stage at, at the, the very bottom there with the largest engines developed about 7.7 .7 million pounds of thrust. That is a lot of energy. And if you talk to people who were present at the time and were there to see and feel and even, or see and hear and feel the launch, they will tell you just exactly how powerful that thing was because you could feel it right here even if you're miles away. It was really an uh, earth-shaking experience. The second stage, now th that first stage burned for something like two and a half minutes. The second stage, when the first one was uh, depleted and, and dropped away, the second stage would take over, burn for about six minutes. The third stage uh, then took over for about a, just under another three minutes to get everything above it into orbit. So what you've got when you reach Earth orbit is an agglomeration of the command module, this gumdrop shaped thing here, behind it, the service module, which contains fuel experiments, instrumentation, power, and so on. And behind that, the lunar module, which would go to the moon and back, and bonus, had a little four-wheel drive vehicle strapped to it. So you've got all this in orbit, ready to transit to the moon. One note about the command module, the only part of the whole vehicle that made the whole trip and came back was the little command module. So a 363-foot rocket weighing 6.2 million pounds was devoted to getting that thing to the moon and back with the three people in it alive and well. That's how much energy and mass it took to throw something about 250,000 miles distant and bring them back. By the way, that little thing over there weighs about 12,000 pounds or 0.2% of the entire weight of the whole vehicle, 0.2%. So you have to use a lot of rocket to get a little thing all the way to the moon. So just exactly how did they get there? Well. Um, we know that their liftoff was on July the 26th, 1971, and their translunar injection, in other words, the point where they made another engine burn to leave Earth orbit and intercept the moon and enter its orbit, that took place at about 12.30 p.m. on January, or I'm sorry, July the 26th. It was only, um, about three hours into the mission. So they achieved orbit, they made sure everything worked, and once they were sure that everything was working just fine, they initiated the, the translunar injection. After that, you've got a couple of days to coast. Now, one of the things a J mission accomplished in the process of getting to the moon was a refined, uh, let's call it a ballet move, a methodology for making the rocket burn that gets you out of Earth orbit and on your way to the moon, and at the same time allows the vehicle to come apart, turn around, approach the lunar module, extract it, and give you the final kind of configuration, which is the command and service module hooked up to this crazy spidery looking lunar module. All that ballet took place in a more efficient manner 
on Apollo 15, a fuel saving manner than it did on earlier missions because the technology and the techniques were always being refined. Um, so imagine performing the math functions to make that happen. Um, I'm always amazed by the mathematicians who could see this in their heads and then make it happen in three dimensions in, in actual engineering reality. It's really, really quite something. Well, when they achieved lunar orbit, of course, it's time for the lunar landing. That took place on July the 30th, 1971, <clears throat> at 6.16 p.m. Eastern time. <clears throat> so, 6.16 this evening will be the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15's landing on the moon. So whatever you're doing at 6.15 this evening, stop for a second and look at your watch, and when it's 6.16, think 50 years. 50 years since an all-Air Force crew landed on the moon. Well, what about working on the moon? These guys had predecessors of other Apollo missions, 11, 12, and 14, not 13, as we know, we all know that story from Hollywood and so on, but they had three missions of other crew that had landed and worked on the moon. Well, these guys had a larger slate of activity. These guys were really going for the gold, <laughs> he said in the middle of an Olympics year. <laughs> um, I just got that on my brain. Um, these guys were, they really had a lot to do. So they performed three different lunar EVAs or extravehicular activities. The first one allowed them to deploy the, the rover and drive it just under six and a half miles. Now the lunar rover had a pretty good range, but they did not explore its full range because if something broke, they had to walk home. So the limiting factor was stamina and the equipment they were wearing. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna stress the lunar roving vehicle to its limit, but it, it, did, it did have a pretty good range, which we can go into a little bit later. The first EVA with the rover lasted about six and a half hours. Now that's a long time to go walking about the landscape for anybody. Go hiking for six and a half hours uh, in casual mode in your shorts and flip-flops and see how tired you get. And then think about, let's do this on the moon wearing kind of restrictive weird clothing with a very serious agenda of things to do and take care of and accomplish along the way. That is tiring. That is tiring, but these guys had practiced so hard for it and were in such good shape that they accomplished that without any, without any issues. The second lunar EVA took place the next day on August the 1st and covered even more ground just under eight miles in the rover. Uh, they visited a couple of notable craters and the second EVA lasted seven hours and 12 minutes. So they're getting better and better at it. The first one was exploratory, but tiring. The second one went even further and they did even more. And all of the places that they were slated to visit were decided well beforehand by lunar photography from prior missions saying, uh, in this region of the moon where you've landed, we want you to look at this, and this is interesting too, and then you're gonna go here and look at this, and then go over to this thing and then come back. And all of these features they looked at, of course, were aimed at the, the main scientific objective, which was to figure out where did the moon come from? How old is it? And what can it tell us about our home on the Earth? What is its relationship to the Earth? What can we learn from it? Well, the third EVA, also involving uh, the lunar rover, took place on August the 2nd. And 
it was a little shorter. It only covered a little over three miles and lasted only four hours and 50 minutes. But along the way, in the midst of all of these EVAs with the rover, these guys set up a whole bunch of lunar experiments. There was a whole package called the ALSEP, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, that uh, different versions flew on different Apollo flights. And what that thing basically was, was a kind of modularized thing that they would take apart and set up on the moon, and it contained a whole bunch of experiments. And the experiments just covered every conceivable uh, aspect of geology and atmospheric studies and all kinds of things, heat flow experiments, solar wind, the whole thing. And th the point of setting them all up was to, to get them far enough from each other that they didn't interfere with each other, and also setting them up uh, in such a way that they could make sure that it was working right. That would have been very, very hard for a machine to do at that point. Uh, it, it needed that human touch with, you know, four fingers and a thumb over here and maybe tools over here. It really required that in order to get all that stuff working. Well, they had some, I mentioned new equipment to work with. Now, I'll try not to spend too, too much time on this because I'm going to talk about spacesuits on uh, Sunday, day after tomorrow. But I do want to spend just a minute on this. One of the things that helped Apollo 15 astronauts achieve all this hard work in these long EVAs was a new suit of clothes. These guys had suits like this on the moon. And I've got a photo here of what's underneath the insulation layers. And the critical part of this suit that helped them drive the rover and also bend down more easily to pick things up and to manipulate things was this zipper going from the chest around the back and ending on the opposite waist. This allowed much more mobility in the waist. The suits for moonwalking before that had a zipper that started here, went down the back, through the crotch, and ended up here with a big kind of a beaver tail thing that would button right here. Those would not have allowed people to sit down and drive the rover because the waist mobility just wasn't there. If you watch films of Apollo astronauts, you'll see that people wearing the A7LB suit as opposed to the A7L, people wearing this one are able to do this and able to do this and get back up. It was a much more mobile suit, but it was a bear to engineer because all of the things inside the suit, all the connections and uh, the water circulation all, and the electrical connections, all that stuff had to be rerouted in such a way that the zipper didn't cross them. It was difficult to don and doff because when it comes apart, it's very floppy. It, it's really hard to figure out what's what when it's, when it's not in one, one piece. Well, it, it was in one piece, but it, it just very, very open. And so the A7LB was a great help in driving the rover and working on the moon. You can see some great photos online of engineering studies for the A7LB suit. There's one great picture, which I'll use Sunday, of the engineers who created the suit looking at a test subject who is sitting on a mock-up rover. And it is a crazy science fiction picture of somebody sitting on what looks like a lawn chair with wheels. And these, these engineers are sitting there going, yeah, I think that'll work. And they're all decked out in super 70s gear with the, you know, with the, with the plaid pants and the huge ties and everything. It is an absolutely great photograph. So come back Sunday and we'll take a look at it. I'm sure those guys are still out there someplace and they'd be mad at me if I showed pictures of their 70s gear, but Everybody had 70s gear if you, were, if you were working back then. So the rover itself, the little four-wheel drive vehicle, 
What a great little contraption that is. And some of our friends from, uh, from NASA up the street by the lake, uh, I think will be joining us to talk about rovers and demonstrate some of the technology. But having a vehicle to drive around on the moon, what a great aid. Now you're no longer restricted to just how far can I walk or not so much walk as bunny hop. Watch the films online and you'll see people don't put one foot in front of the other generally. They kind of gallop like this. It's hard to do with gravity, but it, it's funny looking, but that turned out to be the best way to get around. Well, this is an even better way to get around. But some, some facts about the vehicle. It was, of course, an electric vehicle. No atmosphere to run a, uh, an internal combustion engine there. So it was an electric vehicle. There were three of them made. And the one on this mission went almost 28 kilometers in three hours of use. The thing was made mostly from aluminum, so it was light, and it carried really uh, um, the minimum stuff that it needed to navigate and get around. Each wheel had its own drive, and there were, uh, there were even motors for turning, and the brakes were separate, of course, as well. So this truly was a four-wheel drive vehicle. And the wheels themselves, I think, are the most interesting part of the whole thing. Inflatable pneumatic tires would not have been useful in a lunar environment because the astronauts themselves were already inflated pneumatic things, right, and in, in, their, in their spacesuits. But the tires of this vehicle, you can see some detail here, were made of steel and aluminum and titanium and those tires are, they look pretty stiff but actually they're they're quite they're quite flexible um, they could run over a rock and flex and just come right back and so the tires worked out quite well you can see in some of the later apollo mission films that that vehicle would throw up quite a rooster tail of dust and, and uh, lunar material behind it. I mean, a big rooster trail. It looks like they're having a lot of fun driving it. But as I mentioned before, this was not a cheap vehicle. It ended up, uh, let me make sure of, of my figures here. Yeah, it ended up costing $38 million. But that's not just the material. That's all the study and engineering and everything and testing that had to go into creating it. And it, it wasn't just a vehicle that they attached to the spacecraft. The vehicle had to fold up into a very small package held together with tapes and pins. And then when the astronauts deployed it, what they did was they came down out of the lunar module and there was a system of fabric tapes and pulleys that all they had to do was pull this thing and the thing would come down in stages and it would unfold at the same time and the pins would come out of it and everything would lock into place and then they were ready to go. All they had to do was engage the batteries, make sure everything worked, and off they went. So an engineering marvel. I'm sure the next time we get to the moon we'll see something like that. It may not look the same. It might be bigger. It might be better equipped and have a longer range, but this will be the one that started the whole idea of driving on the moon. So what about all these experiments? I mentioned the, the ALSEP, or the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. It was full of all sorts of stuff. I've got a list here. A radioisotope thermoelectric generator was separate from the ALSEP, but um, having a generator to, for power was important. Uh, the ALSEP experiments included a seismometer, a magnetometer, a solar wind spectrometer, a super thermal ion detector, a cold cathode ion gauge, a lunar dust detector, a heat flow experiment, and some other smaller things. The astronauts didn't necessarily need to know all of the science behind these experiments, but they had to be intimately familiar with how they were built and how they were supposed to be set up to work effectively. 
once the ALSEP was turned on, all those experiments began collecting data. And recall, this is the summer of 1971. The ALSEP was shut down on the last day of September 1977. So all those experiments worked for several years and collected data that has helped us in the interim understand what the moon is about and how it relates to us here. The value of learning about lunar science for us is really about learning where the Earth came from and what its long-term prospects are, because the more we know about our own uh, planetary past, the better we can deal with our own planetary future, because we'll know what it is and where it came from. Added on to all this, Apollo 15 was the first space mission to launch a lunar sub-satellite. So here comes this great spacecraft going all the way to the moon, and then it launches its own mini spacecraft as a satellite around the moon. Uh, that was called the Particles and Fields Sub-Satellite. It studied um, uh, plasma and particle phenomenon around the moon. Believe it or not, the moon does have an atmosphere of sorts, not like we normally conceive of, but it's got stuff around it. And so measuring things like plasma and solar wind and things like that are important for, um, for physicists and, and planetary geologists and, and people who study those things. Oh, I forgot to mention, let me just go back one. I can't fail to mention the marquee demonstration, the hammer and feather experiment. I almost missed that. This was one of those signature Apollo moments. To demonstrate beyond the heavy, deep, and real science, some real fundamentals of how the universe works and the laws of physics. The hammer and the feather experiment, and there's a painting of it here, done by an astronaut, no less, because there's, the film of it is really grainy. It's hard to figure out, but the painting is better. You can see here is a feather. And here is a hammer. On the lunar surface with no uh, sensible atmosphere to interfere with, if you drop two objects of radically different mass, which one will hit the ground first? And the answer is neither of them. They will both hit at the same time because it's atmosphere that impedes things. And so, of course, the hammer was a geological hammer. The feather, hooray, Air Force, was a falcon feather. That plugs into the, uh, the, um, the lunar module name, too, falcon. But demonstrating that was kind of a bonus. It wasn't you know, a big official part of scientific inquiry because we knew the answer already. But demonstrating that fact of the universe was one of those signature Apollo moments that a lot of people have remembered. So only place you've been where you could actually demonstrate that. Right? That's true. Where, yeah, how many places can you go where you could demonstrate that? That was a great opportunity. I'm glad they thought of it because um, that's just the perfect place. You know, here we are no atmosphere, which one of these things do you think is going to hit first? And they both fall at exactly the same rate. It's just perfect. So the return to Earth. Getting back from the moon was, a, you know, a, a delicate dance because they had to uh, uh, lift off from the lunar surface and then rendezvous with the command and service module, turn the whole thing around, make another super accurate burn to get back to the Earth in just the right spot at just the right time, which they did. I've lost my place in my notes. At any rate, they, they did get back in the right place in the right time, and along the way, uh, there was one more EVA where the command module pilot, um, Warden, went out to retrieve film and, uh, and other things from uh, an equipment bay behind this spacecraft behind us. That kind of deep space EVA 
was a really great opportunity, just an individual opportunity for the, for the human being involved to be able to see that is my home planet, I can see all of it, and that is my planet's moon behind me. Performing a deep space EVA, it's part of the job, you know, you gotta get it done, gotta get it right, but think for a moment if you were in that person's shoes and you were outside the spacecraft about midway between your home planet and its moon. What a feeling that would be, right? Here I am, just me, in, well, for us so far, that's deep space. That is deep space for now. If we end up going to Mars, and I think that probably will happen, we will have a new understanding of what deep space really is and being able to look at our planet as a tiny dot will be a whole new experience for humans. I think that's coming. When? Your guess is as good as mine, but I think that's coming. On the way down, not everything went exactly to plan. You see a picture here of Apollo 15 coming down in the Pacific Ocean. One of the three parachutes malfunctioned and collapsed. That meant that the other two parachutes had to do all the work and the command module hit the ocean a little bit faster at a little bit higher rate of speed uh, than was planned. However, that was a contingency that was not unforeseen and so despite a kind of a rough landing and a good smack, everybody was okay and the spacecraft survived and everything was fine. And so that was the end of the mission. And what were the results of Apollo 15? You know, what, what did they achieve? Well, they achieved the longest mission to date with the longest amount of time spent working on the moon and studying. They validated a lot of new engineering concepts for Apollo missions. They demonstrated that the new suit in the rover could work, and not least of all, that people could continue to push the limits of how much work and how much time you could spend in space doing useful work. It also pushed the volume and character of science on the moon and in orbit. And so it was, along with other missions, and advance in all of those areas. So in all of these respects, Apollo 15 was A, valuable, B, a success, C, something to build on for later. So the first of the J missions, with all these firsts, was a great advance, not only for the civilian space agency and all of the scientists involved there, but a great point of pride for the Air Force because these three astronauts pulled it off in spectacular fashion and um, hence, we have the spacecraft today. So uh, 50 years later, we're still proud of Apollo 15, and we like talking about it, as you can tell. So with that, I'll open it up for your questions. Hopefully, uh, I have answers, or I can tell you where to find them. Yes, sir. Is there a lunar command module here in the... Uh, the question is, is there, a, is there a lunar module in this museum? There is not. You can see um, one that was used for engineering test purposes at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. And you'll be surprised, it's really big. I'm always surprised when I see that thing because the interior is really quite small, but the whole thing put together with its, um, with its descent and stage on the bottom of it with the big legs and so on, it's really quite big. It's, it's tall, it's, it's much bigger than the command module. And it's really an impressive thing. And when you look at the ladder that they had to climb down on one of the legs, uh, climbing up and down that ladder wearing one of these suits would be an Olympic event, right? And the last step, and some of the astronauts commented on this, the last step off the ladder was kind of far. It was, it's a couple feet. 
And so for some of the taller astronauts, you know, that's one small step, but it's a great big leap for some of the other smaller people. <laughs> so uh, it's an interesting thing to look at, but you have to go to Washington to see it. Ken, do we have any Facebook? Oh, yes, sir. Obviously, we've had a lot of equipment left on the moon. Mm -hmm. Have we ever gone back to one of the locations where the equipment was left from a prior mission? Uh, not an Apollo mission. Apollo astronauts, I don't think, have been to an, another Apollo site. They landed in, in disparate areas and were not able to get to other Apollo sites. But we know where all the equipment is, and in the intervening years, we've actually found where some of the inner stages of the spacecraft smacked into the moon because uh, I think one or more were, were intentionally crashed into the moon to cause a seismic event so that the seismometers that the astronauts placed there could measure that and find out more about the interior of the moon, which I think is pretty smart. If you've got a big hunk of hardware, why not run it into the moon because it's not going anywhere else, right? Run it into the moon and measure the result to learn more about what's in the moon. What a great thing to do, yeah. It's, maybe we'll find it next time around though, right? If you watch <laughs> an unintentional plug for a cartoon called Futurama, in this cartoon, there's a, uh, there's a vacation spot on the moon where people, people can go and spend time. And you can take an excursion out and see these Apollo sites. And so they go out to see them. And there's a little sign in there that says, this site maintained by Historical Sticklers Association because there's things wrong with it. And it's just, it's a funny cartoon. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, speaking of the command module, uh, I'm assuming there's none still orbiting the moon. Uh, right, the, the, um, the service module, the, the sort of the, the gumdrop shaped thing and its service module behind it, uh, those things came back from the moon together and then the command module separated uh, and came back down. So there's, there's none of them still orbiting the moon, well, that's they correct. Them all the way back. Right, right, so those, um, the yeah, there's, uh, yes, that's right. Right. So, yeah. So those the 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 command and service module engines were required to exit lunar orbit to get the whole contraption back to the Earth. And that you know there was a, at one time there was a a serious theoretical argument about how to get to the moon. Should we, should we launch everything in the most massive and, and, and strong rocket we could build, launch it directly all to the moon? Or should we go into Earth orbit first and then do this dance where you take everything apart and reconfigure it and send something smaller to the moon? So this argument between direct ascent to the moon and then, or on the other hand, build it up in Earth orbit and then go to the moon. Well, it turned out that the more elegant and effective and efficient way was to do exactly what they did, was to build it in orbit, launch it all up there, and then reconfigure in Earth orbit, and then go to the moon, and you're shedding pieces as you go so that you only have what you need when you need it, so that at each stage, you have the minimum weight to push around the universe. And uh, hats off to the mathematicians who figured all that out because not only did the weight or the mass change all the time, both your targets are moving and they're, they're predictable so you know where they're gonna be, but you have to calculate all that mass and figure out how much energy it's gonna take to get it there and what direction exactly you should point it in to meet it where you're supposed to meet it. That is some crazy insane mathematics that I'm sure a lot of our Facebook viewers, probably some of those mathematicians are out there. It's not hard for them, but it's hard for me to even imagine that math. I just have a great deal of respect for people who can do that. I get to talk about it, but other people actually get to do that work, which is hats off to all of them for being able to do that. I think you answered one of the questions we got. Oh, did I? Okay. Already, so, Super. Uh, we reached uh, somebody in Argentina today, which is amazing, and then uh, a bunch of locals here in the States. So. Okay. 
Well, with that, uh, thank you for joining us today. I uh, hope you have a great time here in the museum looking at all our space artifacts and everything else there is to see. And uh, greets to all our Facebook friends out there. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.